on the line we have one of our great grandmaster scholar warriors, one of my teachers. You've seen him in Hidden Colors 1. You've seen him in Hidden Colors 2. This is, a, this is his 11th appearance on the African History Network show. Tonight we're going to talk about the pyramids along the Mississippi River, the early African presence in, in America. I'm talking about none other than Kabahai Wapa Kamene, also known as Booker T. Coleman. Maad Hotep, brother, how you doing tonight? Maad Hotep, brother. I'm Hotep, I'm doing excellent, brother. And regards and Hotep to the family who is listening to the African History Network. It's great to be back, brother, man. Excellent, excellent, brother. And that, and that clip I just played, man, of Dr. King, uh, Malcolm, and uh, Marcus, brother, that's a powerful clip. <laughs> brother, you know, when I was listening to that, you know, I was saying, now how am I going to lead into this discussion on what we're <laughs> going to talk about this evening? Because... You know, history and all of these concepts have their place. But when you yes. listen to M to the Third Power, man, I like how you did that, brother, Martin and Malcolm and Marcus. You know, yes. you have to stop and ask yourself, you know, what can we do right now economically that yes, can yes. make a difference? And what yes, I just yes. want to say to the community is that there is something very practical we could do right now. And that is if we decide that by the end of this weekend, we are going to spend, if everyone who's listening decides that they are going to spend $20 with an African, African-American vendor, whether yes. they are selling DVDs, books, mm -hmm. whatever it you is. Broke, you broke up a minute there. You said DVDs, books, and what's the rest of it? You broke books, up. clothing, jewelry. Yes. Because we know yeah. where the vendors are, whether they are on the streets of our communities or whether they have those shops. If mm -hmm. we decide that we are going to just spend twenty dollars, start there. Yes. Right. That makes everyone listening to this can make that yes. can say that, and then say, "I am going to put a percentage of my weekly or monthly or bi-monthly income." I am going to spend X amount of dollars with a black vendor. Yes. No way, because that's our small business. Everyone talk about small business. Well, the, the vendors, of, the brothers and sisters who are vending the DVDs and the books and the clothing, the jewelry, the soaps, the body creams, yes. whatever it mm -hmm. may be. The oils. The oils. The yes. oils. All of these things. If, if mm -hmm. our community decides that they are going to just start right there with $20, let's just say $20. If twenty dollars is too much, if you think ten dollars, okay. If five dollars, okay. <laughs> Whatever it is, but if psychologically we get into the mindset that we are going to put some green dollars in some black hands by this Sunday, that is an answer that we can do right now, and that's practical. Yes, it is, brother. Yes, it is, and you know when, and that's when how I, I want to just open up my conversation. No problem, brother. I appreciate it. And, 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 you know, we always talk about economic empowerment. You know, when Dr. Leonard Jeffries, one, one of my teachers as well as you, but when Dr. Leonard Jeffries teaches, he talks about that pyramid principle. And he talks oh, about doing go. distance analysis as opposed yeah. to the paralysis of, of analysis. And there African history and culture forms the foundation and it mm -hmm. influences the two sides of the pyramid, which are economic empowerment and political empowerment. That's so it. we have to understand, we have to have all those intact. Oftentimes we find people who are real super conscious and they speak the metal nether and they're real metaphysical and things like that, but the economic empowerment they don't have together or the political empowerment they don't have together. It, 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 we have to bring it all together. That's okay. it. That's so, it. And, so we have and to understand those, that. Mm -hmm. you, and, and, we, and we have to practice that. Yes. And for those yes. that saw... Um, so Hidden Colors, too, you saw Claude Anderson when he was talking about building that building. Exactly, the five levels, man. That was brilliant. And, and, I, and I first met the brother back in 94 when okay. uh, he came to Wayne State University, and um, uh, he was doing a lecture on his book, Black Labor, White Wealth, and I've seen him throughout the years. But, man, and I was so happy to see that he is in Hidden Colors, too, because he's very underrated, and a lot yeah. of civil rights people, they don't want to deal with him. Okay, yeah. but we need to hear that information, brother. So, but yeah, man, that that that's powerful. And and now here's 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 the kicker. This is what a lot of people don't know. Okay, the clip that I just played from Dr. King. Okay, mm. you know what speech that came from? What is that, brother? I've been to the mountaintop the day before wow. he was assassinated. Wow. See, a lot wow. of people don't wow. know that. 
See, yeah. see when, when they show us I've been to the mountaintop on TV, they just show like the last minute. We, we say, I've seen, my eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. I'm going to get to the mountaintop, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And we see that. We haven't heard what he's talking about economics in the speech. Well, you know, check this out, brother, because I've had a chance to be with people who were with him that day. Yes. And, the, you know, the story of that evening, uh, mm-hmm. which for us would be April 3rd. April okay, 3rd, 1960. Yes. There we go. That night, Dr. King wasn't feeling well. In fact, he had returned to Memphis because the first time they went to Memphis, it wasn't successful. Things happened, that, and the march could not continue. Mm-hmm. So it had to be stopped, and he promised that he'd come back. And this was the weekend that he came back. He was not planning to be in Memphis this weekend. Okay. But he came back, and he wasn't feeling well. He was sick. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, went to, uh, he, he, he went to the motel, and he, went to, and he went to sleep. He told Dr. Abernathy to go in his place. When they got to the Masonic okay. Lodge, because that's where they spoke. They spoke at a Masonic Lodge. When they went to the Masonic Lodge, uh, they, you know, like when you saw um, Dr. Abernathy, you knew that Dr. King was close. Right. And many times yeah, when they, people they saw Dr. Abernathy, yeah. they assumed Dr. King was there. Mm-hmm. So they started to chant Dr. King's name. Okay. And Dr. Abernathy said, hey, wait a minute, you know, you know these folks are going to be very upset when they find out that I'm going to be speaking in Dr. King's place. So he goes back and he calls Dr. King and he wakes him up. And he says, look, Martin, man, these folks don't want to see me. They want to see you, brother. you got to get out of here and, and speak to them. And right. so Dr. King, being the person that he was, he got himself together, and he went over and he began to speak. The other piece to that speech that, that, that you're bringing out as relates to that, what Dr. King did when you see that entire speech, he went back to the beginnings of the origins of the human race in Africa. Mm, okay. And, and he I took doubt. everybody through a historical journey from that time to the present time. And that, what you're looking at is they start that speech, because I do a thing on cosmic consciousness and Dr. King and that last speech. Okay. I do a whole thing on prophecy and prophet and cosmic consciousness, and I demonstrate how Dr. King was cosmically conscious. Right. Because he knew certain things that day, April 3rd. That's why he gave mm-hmm. that speech. But as he's talking about this story, right before they say, they normally come right in on, I don't know what's going to happen to me now. Right. And what they don't tell you is that just before that, he had said, we got some sick white brothers out there. That's right, yes. That was the phrase just before he said, I don't know what's going to happen to me now, but I've been mm-hmm. to the mountaintop. That's when, he, that's when they always come in because the great majority of people that want to present that speech do not want you to hear what he said just before. He said, I don't know what's going to happen with me now. But he had said, we've got some sick white brothers. He's talking about the threats that have been on his life. Right. And so that, that speech had so much of his life. You know when they say that when you... Uh, when when you just about to die, that your whole life flashes in front of you. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what happened to Dr. King. But we had the unique opportunity to be present when he had that flashback of his life. He not only had the flashback of his life, he took the human family back to Africa. Right, right. Because 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 he was see uh, Professor Manu and Pema. Now we've done two shows dealing with Dr. King. The first one was the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The second one we did with Willie Ricks, who's known today as Mukasa Dada, who was friends with Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael, and that one was called the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They Don't Want You to Know. There and we go. P- Professor Manu and Pim talked about how Dr. King was a Pan-Africanist. Yeah. A lot of people don't know this, though. Okay? Mm-hmm. And in 1957, when Ghana won his independence, he went to Ghana to be with Kwame Nkrumah at the ceremony. Okay, he he was a Pan Africanist, but people a lot of people don't know this because we haven't read and studied Dr. King. We rely upon the television, That's the television to tell to tell us about Dr. King. But That's but, it. but let me but let me give people this this uh, uh the name of this article quickly. This is from AfricanGlobe.net, and we'll talk about this next week. We probably run out of time today, but it's called Another Side of Dr. King: Black Economic Power. 
okay, uh, posted January 23rd, 2013, posted yesterday. And AfricanGlobe.net, brother, they have some fantastic articles on that. That's one of my favorite websites for information. But they go through and they quote uh, the, 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 um, the excerpts that you heard from the clip I played, they have those quotations right in this article, and they tell you okay. it's, from, it, it's from that speech uh, mm. I've been to the mm. top, you know, okay. so but, but, it, but, we, but we're dealing with weapons of mass distraction, so we don't know that that is from that speech. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's like hitting colors. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely. right in front of us. <laughs> absolutely, brother. And, and, and you see, this, this is the key. Uh, to understanding, you know, when Dr. Leonard Jeffrey speaks of that pyramid consciousness and, and yes. he gives you those dynamics because Dr. Clark used to always tell us, Dr. John Henry Clark used to always say, you cannot get over on a historically conscious people. There you go. Exactly. You, 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 you just can't get over on them. You can force their hand. You can force yes. them by gunning their, their head or by economically threatening them to do as you bid but you can't get over mm-hmm. on them like they don't know what you're doing. Right, right, exactly. And that becomes very trickle. important for us as a people. Right. To know who we right. are and what we have achieved and understand that there are people, you know, you know Joel Augustus Rogers, J.A. E. Rogers, brilliant brother, in his books, he frequently says, and I'm thinking right now of Sex and Race, the three-part volume and uh, mm-hmm. Nature Knows No Color Line, where he says yeah. that the most brilliant European scientist becomes an absolute fool when it comes to race and to culture. In other words, mm-hmm. what he's saying is that you can have people who are mathematical geniuses, who are biology and, 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 and great physics uh, teachers, but when it comes to dealing with the issue of culture, they act like absolute imbeciles. Right. And because these people pontificate in front of us and they do all this talking, we assume that they are intelligent, but you've got to separate academic intelligence from emotional intelligence because some of the greatest people that I've ever met were not academic geniuses, but they were emotionally stable. Right. Some of the most okay. ignorant people I've ever met are people mm-hmm. who are academic geniuses but emotionally unstable. Yeah, you read about that. I've met so many, many people. Times, and, and because as an educator, Brother Imhotep, I've, I've observed our students in particular, but our people in general, and I've been with people who have, had, who have multiple doctorates, who have multiple master's degrees, who academically mm-hmm. – have achieved great things. But when it comes to how to carry themselves as human beings, how to choose a proper mate, how to right. deal with life, they have no idea what they're doing. Exactly, exactly. But because Look we think that no because comments. you're academically intelligent, that you're emotionally stable, we give credit to people who are absolute fools. Or they're acting right. foolish, I should say. Right. The two don't go hand in hand, and we got to understand this. I tell right. people I, I got my doctorate that. from UCLA, the university okay. on the corner of Lenox Avenue, brother. <laughs> I've met more of my professors on the corner of Lenox Avenue than I've met at Columbia University, Harvard University. Mm-hmm. I've met more people who spoke more truth, nodding out on Heron. In between their nods, they'd be dropping some serious gems. Right. <laughs> so, so I know genius does not mean that you get good grades in school. It means that you can process your reality through a cultural common sense. Correct. Correct. I, I definitely agree with that, man. People have uh, book sense but no common sense. There we go. Uh, I, I, I've, uh, I've met people like that, brother, definitely. definitely. Oh, man. Gee, my goodness. You know, and, uh, you know, speaking of the uh, pyramid principle, speaking of pyramids, that brings us to our, our subject tonight, uh, the pyramids along the Mississippi River, the early African presence in America. And mm. I know you called me about two or three months ago, it was now, and you said that you had just uh, done a tour of the pyramids in East St. Louis, and you did lectures on them, things like that. And in Hidden Colors 2 also, they have Monk's Mound 
uh, in there. You talk about that as well. So, so, so first, why don't you tell us about your um, trip to East St. Louis and what you saw there? September 20th, 21st, the autumnal equinox. Mm -hmm. I was invited by the East St. Louis community, in particular, met a brother by the name of Metu Hotep and another brother by the name of James Stewart, with okay. whom I had a chance, to, and he has a lecture series okay. in East yeah. St. Louis and St. Louis for the community there. And mm -hmm. um, I was invited by my brother, Metu Hotep, young brother, East St. Louis, who'd come upon my work and had seen some work I had done speaking of Cahokia. Okay. And uh, just to, to, to prime those who are listening, there's a book entitled uh, Native Roots by Jack Weatherford, Weatherford. Mm -hmm. And Chapter 2 is entitled Pyramids Along the Mississippi. Right. And uh, what's important for us to understand, because you've got to look at it from the entire context of um, what actually is happening in the conversation as it relates to these pyramids. And if you don't get a sense of the overarching concept, then you're going to miss a lot of information. The bottom line is that there was a lively movement around the world long before Europeans ever even knew what a boat was. Right. There were ancient peoples that traveled the world thousands of years ago. And the evidence is there. But the, the peoples today in charge of curriculum and in charge of the magazines and the books that are being published will never let this information out, although the research exists. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's there. I've got some of it. It's there. But like J. Rogers said, these scientists will never let the truth out. Because right. to do that, it will destroy the myth of white supremacy. So right. now, right. when you look at mm -hmm. the work of uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, a, a brilliant right. Guyanese brother, uh, who has now since joined the ancestors, but um, wrote a book entitled They Came Before Columbus, and he right. edited a number of different books on the African presence in the early world. Dr. Van Sertema wrote a book that came before Columbus speaking of the travels of Africans, specifically during uh, the 25th dynasty of ancient Kemet, the travels of Africans that are dealing somewhere between 650 B.C., 525 B.C., somewhere in there. Uh, could even go back 700 B.C. before the Christian era. He also talks about the Malinke movement, Abu Bakari III, uh, his movement to the Western world, taking thousands of ships with him, exploring this part of the world, while his brother, Mansa Musa, is going to go to Egypt. And literally, economically, he's going to break the world bank. So right, that there exactly. is evidence of Africans coming to this part of the world 1,500 years before Columbus. There's evidence of Africans on the Mississippi River 1,500 years before the Christian era. There's evidence of the coca leaf from South America in the stomach of the 19th dynasty pharaoh, Ramses II. There's evidence of these Africans being in this part of the world, the American hemisphere, south, central, and north, and also the Caribbean, including Canada evidence of Africans in this part of the world. But not just that. There is a brother, Nesi uh, Ali, who has written a book that's entitled Paleo-American. Yes. Okay? And this mm -hmm. book, Paleo-American, speaks of the people who came to this part of the world before what we consider the Clovis people or the Algonquin people, who is what our textbooks give credit for being the first Americans. These were a people that looked very Australoid. They looked like the Australians. They, they looked like the uh, Africans, of, well, the, Indi the Indians from the Indian uh, land um, in India uh, called the Andaman. They were, they were short-statured, dark complexion, curly hair, wide-lipped, thick-nosed people. 
These were the original Americans. Okay, the, the, paleo, the Paleo-Americans, right? The Paleo-Americans, and basically you're dealing right. with Paleo meaning ancient, mm-hmm. and uh, American, you know, meaning um, uh, uh, this continent, so to speak. Right, right, and because I know when um, I, I've interviewed Dr. David M. Hotel a few times, who wrote, who wrote the book The First Americans Were Africans, and in his book, because I'm reading his book right now, in his book he talks about the Paleo-Americans. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so the, you know, the evidence is here. Yes. You know, the evidence of these uh, peoples of the original peoples who peopled the earth thousands of years, years ago before Europeans even existed. There were no Europeans on the planet when we're talking about these Paleo-Americans being in this part of the world. There are so short-statured African peoples that have mm-hmm. peopled the globe before Europeans or Eurasians even exist. Eurasians are a very young people on the planet. Africans go back millions of years. When I say Eurasians, I'm speaking of the northern climate. Okay. Because the people that we today call Chinese and Japanese, these are a very young people. They're, they're, mm-hmm. I mean, if I'm giving them credit, they are no older than 10,000 years. And I'm giving okay. them a lot of time. Right. Some people say 6,000. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to get caught up in dates. I'm going to get caught up in chronology. And what I'm saying is that these individuals were not on the planet for the millions of years that Africans have peopled this planet. Right. They just did not exist. And so these Paleo-Americans are here. And these are also question comes, are these the mound builders? Are these the pyramid builders? Because, you see, you've got to go back to understand the role of agriculture. See, because why are these pyramids appearing on the planet? Why are they all facing? When, when I went to uh, East St. Louis, we visited Cahokia, which today is called Collinsville, Illinois. The indigenous people called it Cahokia. Okay, and Cahokia. These in, Cahokia, C-A-H-O-K-I-A. I was on the top of that pyramid at the highest point of the sun on the day of the autumnal equinox of 2012. I went there specifically for the equinox. If I wasn't going to be there for the equinox, I would have been there for the solstice, but I was on top of that pyramid. And as I looked up, the sun was directly over my head, traveling across from east to west in perfect alignment. Right. So that whoever built this pyramid knew exactly the cardinal point. Mm. But not just that. They had to have known where to build that pyramid because it's in a specific place. And when you go back and look at all of the pyramids, now I've got a book that is written by a brother, uh, Bay. It's called Pyramids in America. Okay. What's his first name? You, you know, brother, he, he caught me off guard. Uh, I think it's Umar okay. Bay, uh, but, okay. but, um, but, but I'd like the community to focus on the name of the book. I know mm-hmm. the last name is Bay. The name of the book is Pyramids in America. It comes out of Louisiana. Okay. Okay. I, I, I believe his Our name business. is Umar, but I may not be sure about that, but I am sure about his last name, and I am sure about the name of the book. I think it's R. A. Bay. R. A. Okay, could very well be, brother. Could be R. A. Bay. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I think it's uh, okay. Yeah, I think that's uh, yeah, R. A. Bay. It, it could yeah. very well be, brother. Ra Raul Mar Shabazz Bay looks like it. There is. we go. Okay, could very well be that. That sounds familiar, brother. But I okay. do know the name of the book is Pyramids in America. I do mm-hmm. know it. I, I I know the base that you make contact with him is in uh, Louisiana. That. I know for sure. Okay. And in this area, it is important to understand that the Mississippi... See, the reason why we don't understand indigenous culture is for a specific reason. And that is because, Mm -hmm. like most things in the United States, most things in the Western world, everything is centered around peoples of European descent. Right. So, therefore, most American history books, you start with the 13 colonies, 
and then you do this westward home thing. Because that's the way Europeans came upon America. They came upon the West Coast, and then they traveled, I'm sorry, the East Coast, and then they traveled West. Mm -hmm. But the real issue is that to truly understand, to truly understand Native American history, you have to study the Mississippi River. Because the Mississippi River was to indigenous people what the Nile River was to African people. Right, right, the Happy River, right. The Happy, yes, Happy, because yeah. that, that, that was the lifeline to the civilization developing itself as it moved along this river. And so okay. when visiting Cahokia and being in the, and it's not just one, man, there's a whole bunch. And I had gone to... Um, Mesoamerica with Dr. Van Sertima in 1984. Okay. So I was exposed to the pyramids of Palenque and uh, to Teotihuacan. Dr. Van Sertima took us to various places around Mexico that he had visited, the Stoneheads, where they were, uh, uh, and all. we saw a number of things. But when I went to um, Cahokia, I saw things that were very much like the pyramids of Mesoamerica. So that it's so important to understand that the peoples we're talking about are a people that are cut from the same DNA gene pool. Right. And so that it is very possible that these Paleo-Americans, these early Africans, were in fact mound builders. Mm. Okay, okay, interesting. And um, in the museum there, there mm -hmm. in, you know, in the museum there, there was an elder brother. Metuhotep told me that there was an elder brother that used to do tours of the museum there on the site of the pyramid. And he was a, a, a man of African descent, African-American descent, and that he had said that a lot of, in the early days in the 70s, there was a lot of artifacts that were African. Okay. But when the curators of this museum realized they were African, they took them all out. Mm. So when you go to the museum today, <laughs> you don't see a lot of the things that were there that show an African, an, an African people who were the builders and the people that built these pyramids were black people. They were African people. Wow. So, so what, did he say where they took the artifacts? Are they in another museum? He had no idea. He has no mm. idea where they went. But mm -hmm. I can tell you the same thing about the Statue of Liberty in the, in the Museum of the City of New York. Because when I was going to the city of the museum, uh, 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 to, to that um, example, Dr. Jeffries will tell you about it, that they had mm -hmm. those statues of that African woman that was the first model of the Statue of Liberty. But what was interesting is that when so many of us as African people started going to, that, um, to the museum, they took those statues out. Mm. So, <laughs> I mean, I saw the statues. I saw the statues. So you, you can't erase from my mind what I saw. Mm. It's there, man. It's emblazoned on my mind what I saw. So you can't so, take those memories from me. You might be able to take them from the people that are, are younger now or maybe now would like to go but won't see them because you took them away. But I saw them, so I know that that was a black woman with a, a short afro, and those chains were in her hand because I saw the statue. So did, did you find out, like, where they took that statue? Of I have the, no the idea. I have no idea. There were two of them. And if you go to France, you'll see another Statue of Liberty. Right, so because that's where France. it came from. It was a gift from France. Yeah, it uh, came from, from La Valais. Yes. Yes. And it was decided to be done at a dinner party in 1865 where an Italian, uh, an, 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 an Italian engineer by the name of Bartoldi was there. And they decided that in honor of the emancipation of African people, they were going to build a statue honoring the emancipation, and they used the African woman. Mm -hmm. But that didn't go well with the people that were deciding, they say, you ain't bringing that black woman up in this harbor. Right. 
And so the second one came. The second one looked still a lot of African. They said, you ain't putting that up. And then they brought the third one. And that's the one that's in the harbor today. And from my understanding, that's the uh, the face that's on there. That's the face of the saint of manifest destiny also. Mm. That's, yes. that's where they got that from. Um, I, heard that, I heard that also. But, you know, the yeah. other piece is that that statue, there's a statue of, of, of Aset or Isis that has mm. that, those spikes in the head. Because mm. really that's okay. the sun. You're dealing with the yeah. sun. It's like sun, sun rays, yeah. Exactly. That's what that is. Mm-hmm. Okay. Originally, it was the Afro, short crop Afro. Oh. Okay. And then through the oh. workings of, of white supremacy, it became what it became today. Because these people are sick, brother. They're, 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 they're mentally ill. They have a very serious problem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I totally understand that, brother. You know, and, and you're like, you know, but, 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 but you see, I'm, you know, I'm not saying it's an anger. Mm-hmm. I'm concerned about their mental well-being. Right. Because I think they're all collectively in Congress today, I, I think they're all having an epileptic fit, man. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to come down on them like that, but they're acting kind of crazy, brother. Right. You're right about that. They're, they're acting in a way that I have never seen. But see, this mm-hmm. is the end of white supremacy. Right. And Marcus told us, the uh, Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey told us, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us, Booker T. Washington warned that this was going to happen. The boys promised it was going to happen if white folk didn't change their ways. Mm-hmm. And it's sad because I'm literally seeing them have a nervous breakdown collectively. Right. But... That's a whole nother story altogether, brother. Anthony. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, exactly. <laughs> that's a whole exactly. other story. And even that's more psychological than anything else. But uh, the idea is that if Africa, if, if Af- as African people, if we know our history and we know what we have contributed, then we can contribute it again. But whatever the contributions are, if we don't have any semblance of an economic program, Correct. it means absolutely nothing. I totally agree with that, brother, because we have to be able to provide the employment for our youth, provide the employment for our college graduates, provide employment opportunities for those who are are what we call returning citizens. They're coming back home from prison. If you can't provide employment opportunities for brothers and sisters coming back home from prison, they're going right back, okay, because because it's hard for them to find uh, uh, jobs uh, in, uh, you know, in non-African-American-owned businesses. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very difficult for them, especially when they have not been rehabilitated at all. Okay? Absolutely. You Absolutely. know, and you never see, brother, been rehabilitated in the first place. Go ahead. Absolutely. And, and if they by chance decide they will never go back to be incarcerated, mm-hmm. they will get a job through another means of peoples of other cultures and at that point, brother, I ask us, why should they respect us? We're mm-hmm. not meeting their needs and solving their problems. Right. And as Amos Wilson taught us, Dr. Amos Wilson, he said any good organization meets the needs and solves the problems of its people. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and, that's what, that's, that's and even the churches that exist offer our people a meal. They offer right. our people clothing. They offer our people a place where they can live. And so that is why, there, along with the popularity of spirituality and religion, there is also a fundamental supply of the needs of a people, which is food, clothing, and shelter. Right. And we need to get into that state of mind. And that's why I'm encouraging us to go out there this weekend and spend some money with our vendors. Right. Because practically speaking, we're not going to build something overnight. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do everything that we need to do overnight. But we certainly can go out and spend 
$20 with the vendors that we know where they are, whether it is in Detroit or in Chicago or in Compton, California, or 125th Street in Harlem, or whether it's the south side of Chicago, wherever it is, we know where those vendors are. Let's go out there and spend some money with them because they are our small business. Exactly, exactly. That's real, so brother. Take, that's real, exactly, brother. Instead of taking that money and, and going to the club and, and buying your drinks or what have, have you or making it rain, something like that, we need to spend that money with African-American-owned businesses. And see, this this, this goes to what um, uh, George Frazier, I don't know if you're familiar with George Frazier, yeah. uh, uh, success runs in our race and racial success, and he speaks all across the country. Um, he talks, uh, I heard him once, because I've, I've met him before, and, and I've heard him speak here in Detroit a few times, but he talks about how uh, we, need to, uh, qu- we need to quickly become the largest employer, the number one employer of African Americans, because every ethnic group in America is the number one employer of their own people except African Americans, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and he talks about how we need to uh, make a list of, you know, like all the the vendors and stores that where we spend our money uh, each 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 uh, month and figure out how many of those vendors are African American, okay? And if we if we spend in you know if if, if if we deal with two African American vendors, let's double that. Let's go to four. If we're dealing with four, let's go to eight, okay? Uh, Dr. Claude Anderson talks about how 98% of our dollars are spent with other ethnic groups, 95% with Europeans, 3% with other ethnic groups, only 2% with our own people. And I did, I did the numbers on this, man. If we, if we went from spending 2% of our dollars uh, with African-American owned businesses, if we went from 2% to 10%, in one to two years, we can create about 1.5 to 2 million jobs for ourselves, uh, oh. operating based upon the fact that uh, for every $1 billion that's spent, um, uh, Twenty thousand to fifty thousand jobs are created. So if you do, if you just go with an average of thirty thousand jobs, we can create somewhere between one point five to two million jobs in mm-hmm. one to two years. Okay, mm-hmm. just by doing that. Okay, so wow. it's going to come from the grassroots because the NAACP is not going to do that. They're bought and sold by the corporations, and we look and see what's going on in New York with the New York NAACP siding with uh, Coca Cola against the soda uh, against the soda ban. Uh, we can see that because Coca-Cola is a, is a large contributor to the NAACP. Okay, mm-hmm. so it's going to come from the grassroots. It's not going to come from Reverend Al Sharpton or, uh, you know, the NAACP, Urban League, any of them, because they, they're, they're bought and sold. Mm-hmm. So, okay, well, look, brother, we need to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to go to questions and answers, and then I want you to tell us about your uh, about uh, how people get in contact with you and also – uh, where you teach at, at New Paltz uh, University as well, and the okay. curriculum that you put together also. We want to okay, talk about brother. that as well. Okay? okay. All right, family, you listen to the African History Network show. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We're speaking with our brother, Grandmaster Scholar Warrior, Professor Booker T. Coleman, Brother Kabahai Wata Kamene. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, brother. Hello, family. This is Michael M. Hotel host of the African History Network show, and I want to let you know that my new lecture, Should African Americans Celebrate European Holidays, the History of Christmas, is available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. This is a three-hour presentation. It is fantastic. In this multimedia presentation, I deal with the historical origins of Christmas going back to the pre-Christian era and looking at the ancient winter festivals celebrated among Europeans like the Festival of Saturnalia amongst the ancient Romans, the Festival of Mithra amongst the ancient Persians, the Festival of Yule, etc. Most of these festivals took place around the winter solstice, which is December 21st. I also deal with the influence from various cultures, mythologies, religion, literature, and astronomy. Do you really know what you're celebrating? This is a fascinating lecture that is thoroughly documented. Don't take my word for it. Go do your own research. Some of the topics that I deal with in this presentation are why is Christmas celebrated on December 25th? What determines when Easter is celebrated? The origins of Santa Claus? How does astronomy play a role in the celebration of Christmas? Where do the symbols of Christmas come from? The origins of Joata Piet, Black Pete? What has caused the popularity of gift giving? Traditionally, gifts weren't exchanged between family members. A lot of people don't know this. 
is item number 743 at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can also get my six DVD bundle pack, which has all six of my lectures for one low price, item number 747. You'll get parts one, two, and three of the media's deliberate destruction of the African American family. Also, reclaiming our history to break free of the fictitious Willie Lynch speech. Slavery's back in effect, the hidden relationship between the prison industrial complex, the new voter ID laws, and black population control, as well as my latest lecture, Should African Americans Celebrate European Holidays, The History of Christmas. This six DVD bundle pack is item number 747. It's a $110 value. You get all six of my lectures for only $50. And this is listener supported radio, so the only way we're able to stay on the air is by you supporting us and purchasing the DVDs and CDs on our website. So we definitely appreciate all of your support. We don't take that for granted. Remember, right now, let's correct wrong behavior in Mod Hotel. Visit Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, where knowledge is power. Nandy has a wide selection of African history and African American history books on all different subjects, including books by Dr. Walter Williams, The Historical Origin of Islam and The Historical Origin of Christianity. She also has space available for your next party or event. And she's the home to many African-centered activities and lectures in the Detroit area. Don't forget to check out her food as well. And there's free Wi-Fi available. For more information, call 313-865-1288. That's 313-865-1288 for Nandy's Knowledge Cafe. Nandy's is located at 12511 Woodward Avenue in Highland Park, Michigan. Regular hours are Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And be sure to inquire about the poetry night, the book club meeting, and dance classes for all ages. Once again, Nandy's Knowledge Cafe. For more information, call 313-865-1288. Nandy's Knowledge Cafe is where knowledge is power. All right, welcome back to the Advocate History Network show. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Motel. We're having a fantastic conversation with our uh, with our brother, Grandmaster Scholar, Warrior, and Teacher, uh, Brother Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, also known as uh, Booker T. Coleman. Uh, we got, I got to give us, before we bring Brother Booker T. back on, Brother Kaba uh, back on, got to give a shout-out to some of the people in the chat room. Join us at blogtalkradio.com forward slash the African History Network show blogtalkradio.com forward slash the African History Network show. Um, join the chat room. We've got a bunch of people in there, 79 people in the chat room already. Sister Adila's in there, Afu Ra, Anthony Asar L, Shago Wilson, Charles Rivers Jr., uh, Dabu uh, One. Uh, uh, There's just, just a few of the people in the, uh, in the chat room. Let me scroll down see some other people. No Sister Sunshine is probably in there somewhere. Rob L239, Noah Moon, uh, Lewis McKinnon. Uh, just a few of the people in the chat room, okay? So, uh, and also in the chat room, I posted the link for that article from AfricanGlobe.net, Another Side of Dr. King, Black Economic Power. I also posted it on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. So join our fan page. Uh, this past week, we just hit the 6,800 mark, so we have 6,882 um, uh, likes on our Facebook page, subscribers to it. So join that page. I posted that um, that uh, article there as well. And on my personal page, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, I posted it there as well. Send me a friend request. Let me know you listen to the show. I'll give you a shout-out also, okay? All right, Brother Cobb, are you there? Hi, brother, I'm here. Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, so... Uh, before the uh, break, we were talking about the pyramid mounds and economic empowerment and how we have to uh, make sure we can provide employment opportunities for ourselves. And I know uh, you have a uh, curriculum also that you have put together uh, as well. So tell us about that briefly, and we'll go to the phone lines. Yeah, no doubt, brother. Um, Hidden Colors number one. Mm -hmm. premiered in uh, New York April of last year, not this past April, a April before that. And uh, the reason why I tell the story is because the brother executive producer, Tariq Nasheed, put it on World Star Hip Hop. He put the theater trailer okay. on World Star Hip Hop, and it drew a lot of young people 
mm-hmm. to the premiere of the New York showing. And when they came out, a lot of young people told me, you know, that they didn't know it was going to be about that. They said they thought it was going to be like, you know, Nicki Minaj and Waka Flocka right. and Drake and all that. <laughs> and so I said to them, you know, you know, was, was the, they said to me, but now that you open this up, where do we go from here? Right. You know, I, I mean, now that you, now that all this is great, but where do we go from here? And I realized that for many of our community members who have been aware of this uh, powerful information, it was reaffirming. It was a great experience. But for, some, for many of our young people who had never been exposed to this information before, it was overwhelming. Right. And so I shut down. When I say shut down, I, you know, I went back into my home, and I decided that I was not going to do anything until I was able to put together an answer to those young people. And okay. so I went back and I put together all of the material that I've been working on pretty much all of my life, as, as, at least my educational life. And I put together a study guide. It's a 70-page study guide that mm-hmm. has my college courses uh, um, that is more com- – I changed the community – I changed the college format uh, course outline to a community course outline that teaches the African presence in early America, the African presence in Asia – Moors, because I taught all these in college. Right. So I uh, put together this guide for our people to be able uh, to go deeper into these subject areas. And that's what I offer the community free of charge. This is my contribution to our community, because while I do realize, economically speaking, I have DVDs. In fact, my catalog is in the back of the study guide. I have DVDs. Mm -hmm. I have things that are for sale. But there are things that are not for sale. And what is not for sale, I believe, should be the direction that we need to go in as a people. Our people, this is my own opinion, our people should not be charged to do what they should do. And so this is free of charge. All you have to do is email me, and I will attach the study guide back to you. Mm -hmm. And it is really a culmination of my life's work in outline form. And I visit different communities, and I work with our community as to how to implement this in our schools, to our people who are homeschooling their children. Uh, it, this is a curriculum that allows them to look at how they can structure their school day, how they can teach their children, how they can organize their community. And so this is the study guide. I call it Africans Travel the World. And just email me at Kamene, K-A-M-E-N-E, 777, at AOL.com. And because I realized that once that started, some of our community members might just be going to get their pens now. Right. Say it again. Them again. <laughs> Kamene, K-A-M-E-N-E, 777, at AOL.com. And I'll give it again. Uh, with your permission, brother, sometime before this uh, presentation concludes. But email me, and it's yours. Uh, It is the direction that I believe we should go from a curriculum and a cultural perspective as African peoples and how we can educate ourselves as well as our children and our community so that we can become an economically viable community that is respected by other cultures. Exactly, exactly. So... uh... Okay, let's do this. Let's go to the phone lines. We have uh, Mr. International on the uh, in the four one four. I think he had a question for you, uh, Mr. International. You still there, brother? Calling four one four. You still there? Okay. He says, "Listen, let's go to the uh, let's go to who is this, brother Kamara in two seven six in Virginia, brother Kamara. Are you there? Yes." Yeah. Okay, how you doing, brother? Hotel. Hotel, I'm doing fine. Uh, I just had a question for... Uh, Go ahead. Kamenei, uh my question is, uh, is he familiar with uh, Amaru, Amaruka, which means the land of the feathered serpent, and its connections to Africa, and also it being the original name for America? Uh, I cannot say, I, I am familiar with the concept, but I am not fluent. So whatever you tell me, you be schooling me, brother. Okay, well, uh, 
I'm not flowing in it, in it either because I just came across some knowledge about uh, maybe like a month ago, two months ago, something like that, as I was studying uh, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by uh, Dr. David M. Hotel. I did some research on my own. I came across an article by Philip O'Ching. Philip is P-H-I-L-I-P. O'Ching is O-C-H-I-E-N-G. And the article is called Kenya, Maasai, Canaanite, and the Inca Connection. And I uh, cross-referenced that with uh, Ivan Van Sederman's Nile Valley Civilization, pages 201 to 220, and Renoko Rashidi saying that uh, Robert Graves traces the origins of the Canaanites of Phoenicians to Uganda, and Uganda is only 301 miles from Kenya. And in the article I cited about Philip O'Ching, he showed, he showed how uh, Inca, Kenya, the god Inca, E-N-K-I, and all that is just, mm-hmm. all of this just rearranges, and he, gave, he gives you a lot of interconnections to show that uh, uh, basically the same people did it. And then on other things I came across, talking about the land of the feathered serpent, the, uh, the uh, pyramid of the fe- feathered serpent, it basically works uh, the same way as the... Uh, the concept of it, rather, uh, works the same way, similar to the uh, pyramids in Kemet, and also the uh, uh, t- the uh, t- uh, pyramid of the feathered serpent. Uh, it uh, reminds you of the Kundalini concept, which was which, was, which was also named in, in ancient Kemet. There's a lot to it, and uh, uh, I hope you pursue it because you, if you pursue it, I guarantee you you'll be, <laughs> you'll get, run into some interesting surprises. Well, brother, I thank I, you. I, um, I, I used to think that uh, America was named after America Vespucci, but I don't believe that anymore. Mm. Well, you know, I thank you, for, particularly for your cross-referencing, that you're giving more than just one source, and it's, it's obvious that uh, in your study that you are cross-referencing and study many different documents, and it's like putting a puzzle together. And so yeah. I appreciate the numbers of of uh, documents that you've shared with us to be able to do that. And, of course, now the feathered serpent, what you're looking at is that you're looking at the diadem of the pharaohs because, of course, you know that you had the vulture that was called Mut with the cobra that was called Irta, and that the feathered serpent also is how you translate the word Quetzalcoatl uh, from the indigenous American peoples, which, which Quetzal means bird and Quetzal means snake. And also, of course, when you're dealing with a feathered serpent, that is the dragon. The dragon right. uh, throughout the, 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 the most ancient part is the one uh, concept that you hear coming constantly to the fore in all of the ancient cultures, this idea of a feathered serpent, a flying snake. And yeah. So and that that... You... Go ahead. No, I was going to say, as it relates to the word Americas, there is a brother by the name of Jan Carew who has just joined the ancestors, and right. he wrote a book called Fulcrums of Change. And in this book, he speaks about Alberigo Vespucci, who is going along the Mosquito Coast, which is in Nicaragua, and he comes upon an indigenous people that's called Los Amerisques. And he changes his name from Alberigo to Amerigo in honor mm-hmm. of this word, which means like the wind or the breath of the creator. It has a concept of gold. And he changes, Alberigo changes his name. In fact, many indigenous people said that the Portuguese had a disease that only gold could cure. So that <laughs> in changing his name, it's obvious that his name was not Amerigo. He was not born Amerigo. He was born Alberigo. And according to research, you will not find him being referred to as Amerigo until somewhere around 1505. Mm-hmm. I've and, heard that uh, this, yeah. I mean, this is coming out of the book Fulcrums of Change mm-hmm. by uh, a brilliant uh, Guyanese scholar, friend to Dr. Van Sertema and fellow countrymen from Guyana, J-A-N-C-A-R-E-W, Fulcrums of Change, F-U-L-C-R-U-M. Good book. Uh, yeah. But again, it goes back to the name of America. But, I, but I'd also like to ex- extend the concept and just a thought to our community, because mm-hmm. I know that we're spending a great deal of our time attempting to figure out 
what our ancestors called this part of the world as a continent and what we called Africa. We're searching for that word. And I've often uh, thought about the fact that I don't know if our ancestors had a name for the continent. Right. Because I believe that the early cultures, African indigenous, were really focused on nationhood. And nationhood were natural boundaries that separated one people, although related to the other people, it separated them. So that you might have a Konso people, you might have the Omo people of Kenya, you may have the uh, Apache or the Arapaho, or whatever else in, in the indigenous nation may be. I don't know, and we, I, we still have a lot of research to do on this, uh, okay. but I don't know if our ancient ancestors were so much concerned, because you see, naming a continent is really a territorial reptilian brain idea. And they you said, said reptilian that the, brain? You said yeah, reptilian, reptilian brain? Yeah, the R okay. complex, man, that fight or flight, that, that animalistic brain, the territorial brain, the, uh, the, the brain that, you know, they say when Europeans came in and stole something from people, they built a fence around it. So not only did mm -hmm. they steal it from you, but they built a fence around it and told you you couldn't come back. Right. You see, so that I don't know if the ancient world was so concerned about naming a continent as much as they were concerned about the name of the nation. And we can right. see this in many of the ancient civilizations. Now, that is not to say there was not a word for the continent. I am just offering that as a thought because when you get down to it, what they call the continent really is not that important. What they call mm -hmm. themselves is what's important. Right, right. Yeah, you know, and from my research and having talked to uh, Renoko Rashidi on this and uh, Dr. Ricchetti, I mean, Dr. Walter Williams, and Ooh. Anthony Browder. Uh, Ooh, that's a living I, libation right there, brother. <laughs> because what happened was for African Liberation Day um, last year, 2012, I did a, uh, I did a presentation, and part of my presentation – uh, one of them was dealing with the real life inspiration for the character of Uncle Tom. That's Josiah Henson, uh, and he was not a he was not an Uncle Tom either. Uh, but uh, the second part of the presentation dealt with uh, was uh, Africa named after Scipio Africanus. And you know, you and I have had this conversation before also, and I talked to the local about it because somewhere along the way, this lie got started that Africa was named after Scipio Africanus. And I went through and proved, and I went through and showed how linguistically, etymologically, it could not be named after him because Africanus means belonging to Africa or of Africa, and I cited a Latin English dictionary. I went out and bought a Latin English dictionary, dictionary preparing for this presentation. And then also uh, in the Encyclopedia Britannica and the Columbia, Encyclope Columbia Encyclopedia, they tell you that Africanus took his name after the, after the name of the territory that he conquered, which means it was already called Africa at that point. Not saying that's the original name, but it was already called Africa at that, at that point, and he took his surname after that because that, he was not born with that name Africanus. That's the name that he took after he conquered the territory that was called Africa. But for my research uh, and talking to these scholars, uh, we did not have – we didn't name the continent. We named different regions of the continent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, um, so – and I talked to Dr. Williams, man. He said, he said you probably never find the original name <laughs> of what we call that land. He said don't even waste your time with it. So you – know, Exactly. And that's exactly what I say. And, you know, the other piece is, is that I don't know if there is a name. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know if there's a name, and I don't know if our ancestors cared, mm -hmm. nor do I think we should care. Mm -hmm. That's not to right. say that those who wish to seek it should not continue, because any form of study of us is good as far as I'm concerned. So I dare not say, but my research, there are so many things that we need to do with our time. Right, right. We have to be careful how we choose to use our time and we have right. to use it wisely. It's like trying right. to find a, an African word 
for a senior citizen's home. You're not going to find a word for a senior <laughs> citizen home because Africans never had them. Right, or prisons. Yeah, we yeah, have, or, Yes, or, 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 a, or an orphanage. <laughs> there are no African words because within a cultural common sense that would never bring anything into existence like that, they have no need for it in their vocabulary because when would they ever use it if it didn't exist? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You see, so that many ancestors were talking about visiting nations. They didn't talk mm -hmm. about visiting Africa. Right. Right. Because exactly. how can you exactly. visit a continent? Right. I told Even you today, that, we, don't, we may say we're going to Africa, but they say, well, where in Africa are you going? Oh, I'm going to Kenya. I'm going to right. Egypt. I'm going to Uganda. So that's really where you're going. You're not going to Africa. You're going to Uganda. We're going to the country, not the continent. Exactly. exactly. And even within yeah. a country, you might say, I'm going to visit the Twi, or I'm going to Yoruba land, or I'm going uh, to, to uh, e Igbo land, or House mm -hmm. of Fulani. Even right. there, you might not even say the country. You might say the people that you're going, and then someone's going to say, well, what country is that in? Right. And then we know that those countries were created in 1885, by Europeans who carved up Africa at the Berlin Conference. Mm -hmm. So even Berlin the Conference. countries don't exist. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, because those geographical boundaries that are there now, basically they, they come out of the Berlin Conference. That's not the original boundaries that, that our people had. Yes. You know, yes. you can go to Ethiopia and Kenya. If you go to the northern part of Kenya and the southern part of Ethiopia, there are a people who in the ancient, before the intrusion of Eurasians, it was called, they were called the Konso people. Mm -hmm. But because Kenya was separated from this land that we today call Ethiopia by the British, now the Konso people are either called Kenyan or Ethiopian. You can right. go to West Africa with Liberia and Sierra Leone, and along that coast, there were a people known as the Vai people, V-A-I. But when Sierra Leone and Liberia were divided by Eurasian, the same Vai people who were one family, now they're called either Sierra Leonean or they're called Liberian. Mm -hmm. So these boundaries are political and economic in nature, but have nothing to do whatsoever with the cultural, natural boundaries of a people. Right. Right. Okay, let's go back to the phone lines. Let's go to uh, the 864. Let's go to Brother Shabazz out of South Carolina. Uh, let's see, Brother Shabazz, you still there? Yeah, what's up, brother? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Okay, right. excellent, brother. Uh, yeah, first of all, I have brother. to give, I, I want to give, uh, definitely give uh, Brother Booker T a, a, a real big shout out, even for laying down um, all that infinite amount of information on the Hidden Colors 1 and 2 and the many, many, uh, you know, lectures you have put out. But, you know, I guess my reference was going back to when we're talking about nation building and building ourselves up even inside the, the work structure or building our own economic, uh, you know, base. Uh, written, written the spirituality or having a foundation inside of, from what I know, the supreme form uh, uh, of spirituality and uh, being led through the metal netter, uh because even when, when I looked at the discipline of my eye, uh, she definitely helped me get my helped me get my life in order and, you know, to become on that right path. Uh, am I wrong by thinking that, uh, you know, we can work together with having different forms of spirituality and, you know, this person is worshiping this thing over here and then, you know, can we still, you know, work together, or how, how, how would that transition? My perception is that there is only one spirituality, and that out of that spirituality, because possibly of geographic boundaries, the stories that are told that represent that one spirituality manifest themselves within the cultural common sense of that particular people. And so within the African framework, we see many different forms of the same story being told. Even as we look at the world's major religions from A to Z, from agnostic to Zoroastrianism, they all are telling the same exact story. 
And the bottom line is, if we can start our spiritual journey by understanding that each and every one of us is the image of our creator, having a human experience, if we can start there, and if we can understand that how we treat that person or the entity of nature, whether it be an animal or a plant, that within that there is a living creative force that demands that we respect it and do what we can as the human family. If we start there, Brother Shabazz, then everything else will come naturally because when I interact with you, as many times I've gone to different programs, the God in me will welcome the God in you. The creator in me will embrace the creator in you. And so therefore, how I treat you is how I would treat my creator. Under those conditions, we would have such a positive relationship. We would automatically come together as a people and do what needs to be done, whether it was political or economic or educational or whatever it may be, we would do it right because we would understand that there is only one creator, there is only one story, but that story is told in many different languages. And I think if we can start there, Brother Shabazz, if we can treat each other like gods treat God, creator treat creator, and when I say that, I do believe in the one creator that is both male and female at the same uh-huh. time. Right. And that we right. reflect that divine balance as being part, part of our mother and part of our father. We are that God having a human experience and how we treat each other. See, Dr. Clark used to always say, Africans never said I'm my brother's keeper. Dr. Clark said we just kept him. I don't tell brothers and sisters I got your back. I just got your back. I don't have to tell you. If I see you and you need help, I don't ask you if you need help. I just help you. And if we could get that kind of mentality in place, if we could go, we would automatically build the nation person to person. You know, Edwin Nichols, Dr. Edwin Nichols, a brilliant clinical psychiatrist, he has a work piece that he calls the axiology of cultures. And he says that the European culture deals with its axiology, its point of reference, from human to material wealth. He said the Asian culture deals with the human being to the community. He says that the African axiology, the African uh, point of reference in life, is human to human. Because in realizing you are human to human, what you're actually developing is that the realization is that human to human creates the community so that you have this relationship automatically being created when we deal with each other as humans. He says that when you deal with human to community, you automatically create the material wealth of that community. And so if we were focused on our human endeavors as it relates to each other, to get that together, I believe that many things would just automatically manifest themselves if we just treated each other with a sense of respect and dignity, realizing that how you treat the least of those, how you treat folk who may not have had. And the way I examine that is that I know in New York, and I would imagine in other places in the country, if not the world, there are people who don't have some of the material things that we have, and they may ask us, for some money. And if we have it, we give it. But also we realize that there are times we don't have it. And if you just say, you know, brother or sister, I don't have it, but have a nice day. Even if we don't have something to give them materially, if we just wish them a nice day, if we just regard them as human beings, so that what I'm trying to say is, yes, the answer to your question is yes. Spiritual manifestation is at the foundations of all interactions in the organic world. And so I think that if we got to that point, then Christian would, because all religions came out of Africa anyway. Yes, sir. 
Right. So it don't make it's a difference if you're right. Christian. You know, like I tell folks, I don't have no. You say you Christian? Yeah, I'm Christian. I'm Jewish. I'm Muslim. I'm Russian Christian. I'm Zen Buddhist. I'm all that because I'm an African. An African is only one. Just like there's only one universe, there's only one creator. There's only one story of that creator, and it comes in all different forms. Right. I right. think. Okay. I think. Now, that's my opinion, brother. Because oh, I believe right. in soul science. I believe that spirituality is unseen science. And science is seen spirituality. Science is the study of nature, and nature is the essence of the creator. Exactly. Exactly. I say. Right. I say. Okay, brother. I say, brother, brother, call me, brother. Okay. All right. Hotel, bro. Okay. Be sure, be sure to listen next man. week, man. We're, we're gonna have Dr. Umar Johnson on and Dr. Ray Higgins. Okay. Be sure to listen. Ooh, next week. Okay. Ooh, that's a little bit of there too, man. <laughs> All right. Hey. Brother. Okay. Let's, okay, let's go to the three one. Hey man, whenever I'm around, hey man, when I'm around them folk, man, I automatically yeah. take on my my pen and, and paper, brother, because I yeah, know I'm gonna take some notes that day. Right. Because <laughs> I remember at the convocation, brother, uh, here in Detroit back in 2010, you sitting there taking notes. <laughs> I was taking notes, extensive notes, man. You know, particularly Jeremiah Kamara, brother. I, you know, yeah. I, you know, I went to Jeremiah. Remember when we went to the Wright Museum afterwards after the yeah. convocation? You know, during the convocation, we all got into the right. vans and we went to the Charles H. Wright uh, African American Museum. Well, right. Jeremiah Kamara had spoken earlier, and he said mm-hmm. something that was so mm-hmm. powerful uh, yeah. that I knew I was going to use it wherever I went. So I went up to him and I said, "Brother Kamara, look, man." He said, I, I said, "Man, I got to write down what you said." So can you please say that one more time? Cause, and I said, brother, you don't mind if I use that. I'll always give you credit, just like I'm doing now. I'll always give right. you credit, but, brother, that was such a powerful way of saying something that has become such a problem for us as a people. And what we were talking about and what he had been talking about was religion and spirituality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he said something that was very profound to me as it relates to the religions that we ascribe to as a people in particular, Christianity, because I have, right. a, I have the utmost respect for Christianity because it was our, as African people on the plantation, being treated horrendously that this story of Jesus the Christ gave us an opportunity to hold on to our life. It was a story that became a lifeline. It met our needs and solved our problems as a people being treated ungodly on the plantation. Mm-hmm. And for that I will always be appreciative to Christianity for what it did to take us through the process. But Jeremiah Kamara said at the convocation, he said as it relates to us continuing to practice Christianity the way we do and what it does to us as a people in today's world, he said to continue to practice a spiritual system that no longer meets your needs and solves your problems is equivalent to continuing to carrying the boat on your back after you cross the river. Right. He said, because what got you across the river and helped you across the river now becomes a burden as you walk on the land. Mm -hmm. I never forgot that. I thought that was the most powerful. I give my brother Jeremiah Kamara credit for that. And I also encourage you all to go out and get the book, The New Doubting Thomas. Right, exactly, exactly. I have and and get too. Jeremiah Kamara's books because that brother is a genius. He is brilliant, and he offers mm-hmm. us a perspective, uh, a perspective that is fresh and new. It is respectful, but it lays out a reality that we all must face going in to the 21st century. So I give my props to my brother, Jeremiah Kamara. Exactly. And I believe he, he, he out also, of Atlanta. I think so. And uh, and he also uh, went through the seminary as well, so he understands yes, he uh, the, the Bible. So so that's why he, he, he's really good with uh, Dr. Ray Higgins. Oh, uh, yeah, man. Yeah, he also told that story about that course they teach at theological seminaries called Preaching to the Itching Ear. <laughs> <laughs> Man, they set it up so they, yeah, amen. He went through the whole process of how the ministers will will tell that sermon and how right. they take you through a process, but they've been taught how to do that. Exactly, exactly. People and, don't and, understand them. 
no, program they that don't. they go through, how they and, how, and, how they're taught to program the math. Go ahead, brother. And that's how they start pouring all that money into the collection plate. Mm-hmm. Because this exactly. brother been preaching to the itchy ear, and he's scratching that ear when he's talking. And the more he scratches that itchy ear, the more dollars go into the plate. Exactly. The bigger the car, the bigger the house. <laughs> right. Let's right, get let's real. Go to, let's go to the 402 quickly. We'll try, try to get a couple more calls in here. Uh, let's go to the 402. Call on the 402. Welcome to the After History Network show. Tell us your name where you're calling from. Hey, how you doing? My name is Prentice, and I'm calling from Omaha, Nebraska. I just want to say uh, the land yeah, of Omaha, Omaha Nebraska. <laughs> Middle of the map, center of attention. Everybody, everyone, no wonder everybody attracted. <laughs> oh, man, the land of Malcolm's birth. Yeah, 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 peace, peace, hotel, hotel. I just wanted peace, to say, peace, uh, yeah, I wanted to say, uh, you know, I, I just want to appreciate you uh, doing all your work, you know, Brother Copper, and uh, I just wanted to touch on a couple of bases and see what you, uh, your feelings on the uh, Moorish Nation. I wanted to see what your, uh, 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 was on the, your feelings on the Moorish Temple, um, government. Uh, the Moorish Science uh, Temple of America? Yeah, the Moorish Science yeah, Temple of America? Yeah, yeah. The Moorish Thomas Science Temple of America and the Moorish uh, government of America, uh, Moorish American government. Uh, your feelings on uh, those two cycles. Uh, um, I wanted to uh, touch on the basis uh as uh, as well as get the uh, your email so uh, that uh, you say your email just one more time so that I, I get it and uh, uh, one other basis I wanted to get on was uh, in Hidden Colors one you were speaking of uh, the way that uh, we should communicate and do you think uh, other language we should bring up another language that we can all uh, speak or whatever one and be taught and then uh, the teachings you uh, got it also you got into the uh, teachings of of uh, mathematics and how uh, it's a genius to uh, to move around and um, and it's a part I, I, it might not have been in the hit of coast but it was one on one of your YouTubes and uh, let, it let's was, uh, let, 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 let them answer the first question first. And then okay, we'll okay, please, please, please. please. Okay, go well, ahead. Brother, the first question. Well, brother, let me say this to you about the Morris Science Temple. I have the absolute and utmost respect for Noble Drew Ali and what he brought to us as a people. Um, that is an indiv- He is an individual that we all should know his name. Right. Yes. Uh, He was one of the most profound and charismatic leaders that brought us to a certain point in our life, and he has a classical place in the history of not just black American history or African American history, but American history itself. Right, right. What he offered us as it relates to the process of the Morris Science Temple and where we should be right now, with due respect to all those involved, You cannot have a government if you do not have a force that can defend it. You cannot be a government if you do not have an army and a navy and an air force. You might have a concept, but you don't have a government. You must be able to defend yourself if you are a government. And if you have no means to defend yourself, you might be an organization, but you are not a government. I do believe that concepts that are being taught, we all need to come together no matter what organization that we belong to. And I believe that the Morris Science Temple of America, see, my area of specialty as it relates to the Morris Science Temple is not so much the Morris Science Temple of America as much as it is who we call the Moors in world history. Two different things altogether. But I do respect any organization, any person that is attempting to do something positive for our people. I believe that we have to do it in a way that is proactive and it brings us to a level of consciousness. And I believe that all of our organizations should come together under one umbrella. 
independent of all others, but interdependent of all others. And so that, I don't know if I've answered your particular question about the Morris Science Temple, but, but, but that is how I feel about it. As no, no, you I, definitely I, I, answered it. You definitely answered it, and I appreciate that, for sure. Okay. Let me take you now to the concept of, um, I think, another one of your questions uh, related to language. And yeah, what language. I've encouraged our, our community to do, uh, Dr. Shekhar the Diop wrote a book, Civilization or Barbarism. Right. He has a chapter, a very short chapter in there. It's called Why Cultural Identity? And in this short chapter, he says that when a people wish to oppress another people, this has nothing to do with culture, so to speak. This is just one group of people oppressing another group of people. We can apply it to African people, but he speaks of it in a very generic, in a very general way. And what he says is that if you want to oppress a people, there are three things you take from them. You take away their history. You take away their language and you take away their psychological factor. The psychological factor would be what Dr. Jeffrey called, Dr. Jeffries calls the VIP. That cultures, values, interests, and principles. And to those three things you take from them, you superimpose and force upon these people your history, your language, and your values, interests, and principles. History, we are learning. We are moving through processes of our values, returning back to our values. We are returning back to our interests, and that includes our corn rolls. It includes braids. It includes uh, afro, if you want to call it that. It includes the, the dress that we have. We're returning back to what we did at one time. But language is something that we have to look at and look at very carefully. And my recommendation to us as an African people is that we need to make medumete, or what's called by the Greeks, so-called Greeks, and so-called Greek language, which doesn't exist, but I'll leave that alone for now. <laughs> medumete is called hieroglyphs. We need to make that the African classical language. Just like uh, Greek, or so-called Latin, which is Greek, which they all come from Africa, but just like that's Euro Eurasian or European classical African uh, classical language, we need Meduneta to be our classical language, and we need to go to people such as Sister Riketi Wimby, amen. We need to go to people who are teaching Meduneta. We need to look at the brother, uh, the book written by Arma, A R M A H, the brother that wrote um, uh, Two Thousand Seasons, and the brother that wrote. The Healers, he wrote a book entitled Hieroglyphs for Babies, which is teaching the alphabet letters. We need to start with the alphabet and then move from there using those scholars who, are, who have laid out the teaching of Meduneta. And we as an African people worldwide should return to a, that as our classical African language. However, we're not going to go around speaking Meduneta to each other. So the practical spoken language, my recommendation, is Kiswahili. Kiswahili right. is the largest African language spoken in the world. It is, according to research, and this might not necessarily be true, it might be even more than that, but they say it is the seventh largest language spoken in the world. While it has adapted words, from different parts of the world, it is fundamentally an African language, and that is why it is spoken in the countries that are where the human family came from, which includes Kenya, Tanzania, and parts of Congo, and parts of Uganda. So if I should go to Holland, brothers and sisters speak Dutch, I speak English, we should be able to speak to each other in Kiswahili. If I go to right. Brazil, our brothers and sisters are speaking Portuguese. I speak English. We should be able to speak to each other in Kiswahili. There are many books out on Kiswahili. There are many uh, programs, language programs, on Kiswahili. I am not saying that the other African languages are not important, and I think the more African languages we can speak, the better. 
But if we're going to start somewhere, let's start at a point of departure that already exists. So Kwanzaa is already u- utilizing the Kiswahili language. Kiswahili right. is probably the most popular African language taught on college campuses today. Let's start with where we are right now, and let's build from there. So I am not negating the study of, of other African languages. I'm only saying in a general sense, speaking to our community, the great majority of our community today have somehow spoken Kiswahili, whether it is the words like Nguzo Saba or whether it's Mkeka or Mishuma or, or any of the other symbols of Kwanzaa, the word Kwanzaa itself, um, the seven principles of Kwanzaa, Umoja, right. Kujichagulia. So we've already introduced this language to the great majority of our people. So let's start there and then build from there. Right, and so is that is my recommendation as it relates to language. Medunetta, divine script being our classical African language, and Kiswahili being our practically spoken language. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, all right, but we, I, I got to try to get a couple more calls in, and we only have 11 minutes left in this, in this conversation, okay? Uh, all right, I just had just one more question. That he, uh, okay, go, he go ahead quickly the, and listen offline. Go ahead quickly with the question and, and listen offline. Go ahead. Uh, he was talking about the uh, the genius of uh, of African Americans and uh, you know how we uh, study differently and everything like that, uh, especially mathematics. Uh, <laughs> what would be his recommendation on how uh, we study that and Let bring it back home? Let, let me give you an example, and this is an example that I use. I could do this in multiple different areas as it relates okay, to question. mathematics. It is okay. important for mm-hmm. I encourage us all to go out and get three books. Go on, on, on the website, www.african, I think it's Creation Energy, African Creation uh, Energy. Look at- or that. African Energy Creation. No, it's AfricanCreationEnergy.com. There is a brother that has uh, 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 um, authored three books, one on science, one on math, and one on technology. Those three books should be in every one of our libraries. Because okay, yeah, science... Af- African Creation Energy. Okay. Yeah, African Creation Energy. He speaks to us as it relates to science is knowledge, mathematics is understanding, and technology is application of what you understand that you know. Science, math, and technology are three aspects of the same thing. They are considered to be the, the, the trinity of the physical sciences. Science, math, and technology. Let me give you an example of how we could teach this concept. When you teach addition to our children, you automatically are teaching them subtraction. Addition and subtraction is the same exact thing. However, they are the law of complements or opposites, if you want to say that. As you add, you learn how to subtract. One plus one equals two. Mm -hmm. Two minus one equals one. So when we create our, our tables, our addition tables, we also are teaching the subtraction tables. So my recommendation is that when you are teaching addition, you should also be automatically teaching subtraction at the same time. When you teach multiplication, you are teaching division. If you turn the multiplication table sideways, that's the division table. Right. So that what I'm saying is that we need to teach not individual subjects or items in subjects. We should be teaching uh, concepts. And when I do my staff development, I, I, I take the community through a whole process of visually looking at what it is that I'm talking about, because we are a visual people. And when you're teaching science, it's the same thing. 
When you teach chemistry, there's a question. There's one question in chemistry, and that's what chemistry is. Chemistry is what is matter. Simple. Chemistry is what is matter. Physics, the sentence in physics is what makes matter move. Mm -hmm. Simple. Matter is made, it basically takes up space and it has mass or it has weight. Physics, fundamentally, is the conversion of energy at rest or, or uh, potential energy, into kinetic energy, which is energy in motion. You must teach chemistry and physics at the same time. But you've got to develop a curriculum based around that concept that teaches it at the same time and not separates it. The reason why you teach chemistry and physics in today's educational system is because textbook companies make money. Right. But it has nothing to do with you understanding chemistry or physics. And that's why most people dread the sciences, because it's not taught in a way that our young people and our community can see themselves. We are chemistry, and as we move, we move yep. chemistry. So basically, when you look at chemistry, that is science. When you look at physics, that's spirituality. Because it's the spirit that animates matter. So that, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get to as it relates to how we can take these uh, curriculum areas and teach our children these subjects in a way that they will not only embrace it, but they will excel in it because they will see themselves in it. And when our children see themselves, even us, when we see ourselves, that's why Hidden Colors had such an impact because for once, we were no longer hidden. And right, we could exactly. See it exactly. And uh, once again, if people have questions for you, they want to get in contact with you, bring you in for lectures, things like that, they can email you at commonA777 at AOL.com. K-A-M-E-N-E, commonA777 at AOL.com. That well, is brother, it. That's going, to do, yep, that's going to do it for us. We had a fantastic uh uh, talk with you, a lot of information. We'll have to bring you back soon because I know you're doing lectures and you're developing the curriculums and things like that. So we're going to have to bring you back uh, uh, soon, brother, maybe next couple months, uh, spend some more time with you because, you, you know, you're a wealth of information. Brother, I appreciate you, and I appreciate the work that you're doing. Keep on keeping on, brother, because to the family, right. it ain't over till we win. Exactly, exactly. And I know you're working on your, your live streaming also, so we'll talk about that as, as, uh, as well. Hopefully we can get that going in February also, brother. So no, that, no doubt about that'd be that. Good. That'd be good as well. Okay, brother, have a good night, okay? Brother, you also, and to the family, the very best. Hotep, uh, it ain't over till we win. Just keep on keeping on. The ancestors have a plan. Let's just keep exactly. on keeping on. Hotep exactly. family. Hotep, brother. Hotep.